Okay, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Robert. I'll be your host. Let's go ahead and get started. Apologies, we had a little bit delay. I was trying to share this on Facebook Live, but I'm having trouble with the connection. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and record it and then we'll just get started and continue on. So thanks for joining us. My name is Robert. I'll be your host. This is the Notorious RBG, The Life and Times of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So let's go ahead and get squared away. Hold on a second. So we always welcome people to introduce themselves. If you would like, you can tell us your first name, where you're connecting from, and anything else that you would like to add. And again, thanks for being here this afternoon. We don't have time to do a Zoom demonstration, for instance, like how to use all the different features for Zoom. But if you haven't used it before, or if you're not very familiar with it, it's pretty straightforward. There's a few things that you can customize at your end. Usually the things that people want to customize the most is the sound volume. So I'm speaking in my normal voice. And if you want to raise the sound up or down at your end, you can do so locally. And then also too, sometimes people want to adjust the screen display meaning that they want the slides that I'm showing to take up the full screen. So if you want to do that, um, just play around with, look for something called view options and you can click on or off side by side mode, depending on your preferences. If you have a box, black box that has my name, Robert Kellerman in it, and you want to make that go away, you can either try that um, if that doesn't work for you, you can either exit out, hit the X button, you can minimize it, or you can drag it down to the bottom of the screen. And then again, like I said, if you want to introduce yourselves by telling us your first name, where you're connecting from, and anything else you want to add, feel free to do so. Okay, let's continue on. So for those of you not familiar with us, the name of our organization is Washington DC History and Culture. We're a nonprofit community organization. And for those of you who haven't met before, my name is Robert Kellerman. So thanks for joining us and being with us on this Sunday afternoon, if you're in the Washington DC area, if you're somewhere else in the world, good morning or good evening. And we're gonna be talking about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, born on March 15th, 1933, and unfortunately just passed away this past September. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and we're going to do it kind of more of like a pop culture historical type content. This isn't going to be a legal type discussion on laws and all that kind of good stuff, more of a pop culture type focus. And the things that we're going to focus on for the most part is the book and primarily the exhibit called Notorious RBG. Um, but along the way, we'll mention a few other things that may be of interest to you. One of them is the film on the basis of sex. There was a really well done documentary called RBG, Hero, Icon and Dissenter. And then there was a book that came out uh, a couple years ago called My Own Words, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So we're gonna talk about her life in the context of these things, but most of it is gonna be focused on the notorious RBG Museum exhibit. Now, I'm always curious to know if, what people think of these different historical topics we're discussing. So if you had to describe it, Ruth Bader Ginsburg in one word, what one word would you use? Like pretend um, you had someone visiting you that uh, was from somewhere else and they had never heard of her or didn't know much about her or a child that you were discussing. And if you had to describe Ruth Bader Ginsburg in just one word, uh, well, you don't, don't use the word notorious <laughs> because that's part of the museum exhibit. But if you could only describe her in one word, what word would you use? And if you want to type that in the Q&A, and then what I'll do is I'll go through and see what people have to say. So hold on for one second. So we're getting all kinds of good responses. We're getting determined, frequently, uh, courageous, pioneer, awesome, principled, giant, daring, inspiring, Diva, <laughs> um, let's see, superhero, hero, uh, inspirational, wise, fiery, fierce, persist, iconic, et cetera, et cetera. So thanks, that's wow. So a lot of um, responses. I should somehow, when we're done, try and tabulate all these and see which word came out um, the most. I don't have the ability to do that now, um, but I'll try and do that afterwards. And keep reported on that. So thanks for participating. Let's go ahead and continue on. So again, the basis of our talk today is going to be the kind of the notorious RBG theme, which was a book um, that came out several years ago. 
and these are the author with Ruth Bader Ginsburg herself. And it's a really excellent book and it takes its title from a rapper, uh, Notorious B.I.G. Um, and so, so there's this pop culture context of comparing Ruth Bader Ginsburg to a rapper, which is pretty cool. And the book is highly rated. And so if you haven't had a chance to read it before, um, I really recommend this. It's an excellent text. It's a very quick read. It has a lot of pictures. It's suitable for children, um, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see on Amazon as of this morning, it had a five-star review, so that's pretty impressive. And I'm actually curious to know how many of you have actually read this book. And so if you wouldn't mind, I'm gonna go ahead and ask a poll question. And I'll go ahead and share the results. So I'm just kind of curious to know how many of you have actually read this book. And so I'll leave this open for a few seconds, give you a chance to respond. This will be helpful for me um, because uh, knowing the audience and your experiences will help me in my talk. And so I don't want to assume that um, a large percentage of the people have read the book or have not. So I will leave that open for a few seconds and let you answer that. Uh, let's see. Okay, we're up to, we have a good percentage of the folks have answered. 70% have answered. So it looks like the majority of folks have not um, read the book. And let's see, of all the people that did read it, though, there was only one person that read it, um, but didn't like it. So that's very impressive. And it looks like the people that did read it actually liked it. So anyway, well, that's just FYI. Let me go ahead and stop sharing that. So thank you. I appreciate your participation in that. Um, let's go ahead and close that out. Okay, let's continue on. Hold on just one second. Okay, so these are some screenshots from the book. And I wanted to show these to you, not because I'm gonna read from the text, but just to kind of give you a flavor for what the book's like. Again, it has a lot of visual images and it's a pretty quick read. So if you are looking for a really good overview, of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I really recommend this one. It has a timeline of all the different things that she was involved with throughout her life and career. And then it does have some kind of a legal uh, ease type stuff. Like this is a breakdown of one of her uh, cases that she critiqued. And so frequently a lot of the infamous quotes from Ruth Bader Ginsburg comes from these legal cases that she was part of on the Supreme Court. And then of course, there's a lot of uh, just kind of personal like pop culture stuff to give you a sense of what she was like as a person. So again, if you're looking for a really good book, um, check this out. And then one thing that sometimes they do with books is they'll put out a kind of a study guide type of thing so that people can get more into it and kind of better appreciate what's going on. This one on the right was put out by an independent group, which I thought was pretty good. It was a women's group, but I think they did a really good job of kind of, um, setting up some thought starters if you're going through the book and looking through it and kind of see what some ideas are. Uh, I put stars by some of the ones I thought I would highlight. So uh, one of them is RBG didn't become a feminist until relatively late in life when her students activism spurred her to look at her own life differently and join the movement. So that's just one FYI thing. She wasn't a lifelong feminist. And then number two, looking back at her life, RBG has said there were three strikes against her as a woman, as a mother and as a Jew. And so those were three hurdles that she had to deal with and overcome throughout her lifetime. Um, and then number three, she says, about, fortunately in my marriage, I didn't get second class treatment. Um, and so we're actually gonna talk about her husband, Martin, a little bit later. And then over on the other side, uh, the author included a chapter on RBG's fashion and fitness. Should these topics be off limits when we talk about women in power or should we all just chill? So we actually are in this presentation gonna talk a little bit about fashion and fitness because that is part of the RBG exhibit that we're gonna be discussing. Um, and then the last but not least, uh, number 10, again, we're not gonna go through all 11 of these points. RBG hated being the only woman on the bench and says, I really love this quote, women belong in all places where decisions are being made. So again, just kind of want to give you an overview of what this book is like. It's very um, informative, but it is a quick read, has a lot of images, but the text of it um, is pretty powerful. So if you're looking for something to do, 
you can check that out. So the book was such a big hit, they ended up making a museum exhibit about it called Notorious RBG, The Life and Times of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And the museum exhibit is going to be kind of the basis for our presentation today. I am going to include some other information or other components or whatnot. Um, so this is more of like a Ruth Bader Ginsburg presentation kind of based on the context of this museum exhibit, but including a lot of other stuff as well. Okay, so here's the headline of where the exhibit started. So if you're not familiar with Los Angeles, there's a facility called the Skirball Cultural Center, and they were the ones that organized or designed the notorious RBG exhibit. So kudos to them for putting this together. And here's a picture of the museum. So I used to live in Southern California, so familiar with this facility, great place to visit. Now they don't have the exhibit there anymore. So what I did is I put this schedule together so you can see where it's at. So it started out the Skirball, then it went to Philadelphia, which uh, currently living in Washington DC. So that's just a short mile or short drive up the road depending on the traffic. And it's now at the Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center uh, in Skokie, Illinois. So this is where the exhibit is currently at. Now they're currently closed, I believe, through the January 2nd because of the COVID situation. But I think they have plans to open back up after the first of the year. Um, and so FYI on that, if you get a chance, you can go visit that. And then it's going to be go visiting other museums throughout the country. It's going to Cleveland, New York, Houston, and Washington, D.C. However, all of these locations and dates, you have to take them with a grain of salt because of the COVID situation. So some of these may be subject to change. Um, you'll notice the exhibit has been at the current site for quite a while, and that's partially because they've been closed for a while because of the COVID situation. So again, um, this is the museum exhibit we're going to be talking about. And this is where it is off to next. It's going to go to Cleveland. So if you're in the Ohio area or close by there, you can go check that out early next year. But this is where it's at now. It's in Illinois. And they have a virtual tour that you can take. So this is their website and they have a virtual tour that you can take. Um, it's kind of sort of like this presentation only. Their virtual tour is just strictly 100% the exhibit, whereas the presentation that I'm going through is kind of more Ruth Bader Ginsburg's whole entire life and, not, and taking some stuff from the exhibit, but it's not entirely focused on that. Um, they charge $10 for their virtual tour, and it's, the proceeds go to support the museum program. So if you're interested, you can check out their website. And again, there's the schedule. So currently in Illinois, then going to Ohio, then New York, Texas. And for our friends in Washington, DC, uh, we will be there in 2022. Okay, so let's walk through the museum and kind of give you a sense of what you could see if you were gonna be visiting there. And right off the bat, um, starts out with a portrait of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and one of her robes, an introduction statement on the right. And then I love this quote up on the top, says notorious. I'm not queen. <laughs> I'd rather be notorious. So that's really cool. Um, and again, this is right when you go to enter the museum exhibit. Now, the museum has been at three different sites now. And the pictures that I'm going to be showing you are images of the three different exhibits. So and some of the um, configurations are a little bit different depending on the museum venue that it was at. So just FYI on that. There's a view of that. This portrait that's on display is at the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery, which is in Washington, D.C., by an artist by the name of Everett Raymond Kinsler. He did this in 1996. And this is one of the more well-known painted portraits of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And so right when you come in, that's looking at you. Here is a close-up. And here's the text that accompanies the introduction to the museum exhibit. It says, at the age of 80, Supreme, now granted this was written um, while Ruth Bader Ginsburg was still alive. At the age of 80, Supreme Court Associate Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was reborn as the notorious RBG. She earned the admiring tongue-in-cheek nickname after a series of fiery record-breaking dissents she gave from the Supreme Court bench in 2003 on voting rights, 
affirmative action and workplace discrimination. We'll talk more about her role in the dissents with the Supreme Court decisions a little bit later. Uh, behind the nickname is a woman with a lifelong commitment to equality, justice, and the ideals of American law. She has lived through history and shaped it faced adversity and lived passionately. We're gonna talk about some of the things that Ruth Bader Ginsburg was passionate about, um, kind of in, in the outside of the legal aspects of her life. RBG is determined to fulfill what she believes is America's unfinished promise, expanding the opening words of the constitution, we the people, to include an ever enlarged group. This expansion has been her life's work and she's not done yet. So again, that's the opening uh, text of the exhibit when you go see it. Uh, that's the text that's over on the right. And so let's continue on. So when you go through the exhibit, uh, it's really well done. It's um, sometimes museums get in stuck in the rut of their exhibits are a little dry and this one is not that way at all. I think partially because Ruth Bader Ginsburg is such a fascinating person, partially because they did a really great job putting it together. And then also too, because it has kind of a pop culture fun type uh, aspect to it. They're talking about very serious matters like equality and justice um, and things like that, but they do it in kind of the context of, a, of an entertaining type of way. Um, and so this is one of the first things you see when you find it's this kind of mosaic of different images of Ruth Bader Ginsburg put together. And then it has some textual information um, on some of these components. Now we don't have time to go through kind of every single aspect of the museum exhibit. I thought what I would do is pick out some of the more interesting or noteworthy ones and focus on that. So this is this is a famous saying that uh, coincides with Ruth Bader Ginsburg's career. Can't spell truth without Ruth. Maybe you've heard that one before. How about this one? Fear the frill. <laughs> So this is an interesting image in that we don't really see the details of her face, but you, you can tell who it is just because of the kind of distinctive look of her and then the lace down at the bottom. And then, hey, how many people have a Ruth Bader Ginsburg tattoo? Maybe some of you even on this call, I personally don't, I don't have any tattoos, but don't mind people that do. And so, <laughs> This is a, a Ruth Bader Ginsburg tattoo that someone got with the words, I dissent. So, and again, we're going to talk about the dissent part a little bit later. So FYI on that. So if you're looking for uh, some body art, here you go. Okay, so this part of the exhibit has to do with Ruth Bader Ginsburg's early life. And it's always fascinating to learn about people, whether or not they're uh, famous or well-known, just regular people in general as well. Um, what was their early life like, their childhood and their growing up? and things like that. You can really get a lot of insight and learn about people um, from their early years. And so this is a recreation of the home that Ruth Bader Ginsburg would have grown up in. Uh, and then you can see on the left, there's a caption that says, I feel like a very lucky girl who grew up in Brooklyn. Um, so that's pretty interesting. So again, this is kind of a mock-up of what her home would have looked like. This is a antique radio. Ruth spent a lot of time listening to the radio. And then over to the right, there's two pictures. One is of Ruth's mom, who she was very, very, very close to and very inspired by. And then the picture on the farther right is Ruth as a three-year-old girl. And there's a close-up of the pictures. So we got our first question and someone, uh, Terrence asks, how long does it take to go through the exhibit? And those are always tough types of questions, Terrence. It really depends on the individual. If you're in a hurry, you could probably see it in an hour. Um, I would say maybe two hours is about the average, but you know, there's some people that, that when they go through a museum exhibit, they like to stop and look at every single item and read all the text. And you could probably spend three or four hours if you wanted to do that. So I would say it's kind of up to you personally, but I would say one hour minimum, uh, two hours, maybe average on three to four hours if you're have a lot of time and really a detailed person, but kind of up to each individual. But good question. So this is a picture of the home that Ruth Bader Ginsburg grew up in. It's the building on the left. It's a two uh, unit, two family unit that share a common wall in between the two of them. And her home was on the left. This is a photo from the New York tax office, thus the 665-41 BK sign in the street. Um, and I'm not sure if that's Ruth Bader Ginsburg's um, car <laughs> out in front or not. Uh, 
And where did she grow up at? In Brooklyn, New York. And so I know these presentations, we have a lot of people in New York City, a lot of fans there. So shout out to all our folks in the Brooklyn, New York, New Jersey area. But if you are, aren't familiar with Brooklyn, um, this is a map and you can kind of see she grew up in the kind of south central part of Brooklyn at 1584 East 9th Street. Um, so just FYI. And then if you're not familiar geographically speaking with the New York metro area, uh, Manhattan is up at the top center portion of this photo. And then Brooklyn is over to the right side. So FYI on that. Here's a close up view of the house again. It's the same photo I showed you a minute ago, just more of a close up. And this is what the house looks like today. So imagine that people actually today live in the house that Ruth Bader Ginsburg grew up in. How cool would that be? <laughs> I don't know what that adds to the value, but probably quite a bit. And Brooklyn is very proud of their connection to Ruth Bader Ginsburg. These were some flowers that were laid out um, shortly after it was announced that she had passed away. So Brooklyn's actually produced um, a lot of well-known people throughout history, um, including Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, and hopefully no one will ever do this. I would really be embarrassed if anyone ever showed my high school graduation photo. But that being said, this is a historical presentation. So what did Ruth Bader Ginsburg, back when she was known just as Ruth Bader, look like in high school? Well, this is it. Um, and you can see um, kind of some similarities between her later uh, life. Well, I'll give you a kind of a side by side comparison a little bit later. You can see she was active in a lot of different types of things. Um, and it's, it's kind of interesting the yearbook photo or yearbook listing actually has the person's home address. And then after she left high school, she was off to Cornell University. And then here's the side by side. You can see some similarities. I'm not sure if she likes her high school yearbook photo. I think in my opinion, most people don't like their high school <laughs> yearbook photo, myself included. But again, this is a historical presentation and people want to see what she looked like back then. So FYI. Now, unfortunately for Ruth, her mom passed away right around the time that she graduated from high school. And her mom is really, um, I, I feel like for Ruth Bader Ginsburg, maybe the two most important people in her life personally was her mom and her husband. And her mom passed away right around the time she graduated from high school, unfortunately. And then you can see her father, um, he passed away in 1968. They had more of a challenging relationship, Ruth and her father. He was very um, traditional as far as women's role in the world and how uh, they should kind of go about their lives and whatnot, where his, her mom was much more pro-education, you know, go get a career and things like that. But you can see her father passed away in 1968. He did not get a chance to see her become a Supreme Court justice, nor of course did her mom. Um, so they, Ruth Bader Ginsburg quotes frequently or talks a lot about her mom. I really like this quote. She's talking about her mother. She says, the bravest and strongest person I have known, which is amazing because Ruth Bader Ginsburg, she know a lot of people <laughs> being a Supreme Court justice. You interact with a lot of people, you meet a lot of people, et cetera, et cetera. So according to her though, her mom was the bravest and strongest person I have known. Now, this is a quote that I really like um, from her. And again, Ruth Ginsburg really uh, gives a lot of the credit that she had later in life for the foundation that she built upon uh, growing up as her mother's daughter. And I really like this quote a lot as well. It says, my mother had two messages for me in my growing up years. To be a lady, don't be distracted by emotions like anger, envy, resentment. These things just sap energy and waste time. And the other was to be independent. And, you know, if you look at that quote now, you might think, like, oh, okay, you know, that's really nice. But you have to kind of consider the time that Ruth Bader Ginsburg was growing up. She was born in 1933, uh, women had really just gotten the right to vote uh, like a, a decade and a half earlier. And, you know, the role of women can be changing a lot. But this kind of uh, thought process from her mom really helps to kind of shape her later career in life. Now, after high school, she goes off to Cornell University. Here's a picture of that. And Ruth was really proud of the education that she received at Cornell, made frequent visits back there. This is a picture of her later in life. This is a picture of what she looked like in college. 
And not all of these images are in the notorious um, RBG exhibit. Some of them are, and some of them I've just um, added on to kind of give you some supplemental stuff. This is Ruth Bader when she was the maid of honor at one of her relatives' weddings. So this isn't actually her wedding. She was the maid of honor at this wedding. But um, a few years later, it was her turn. And so this is a picture from her wedding. And we'll talk about her husband in just a minute. Here is her husband, Marty. They met in college. And he's probably the one of the other important person in her life, again, along with her mother. And they include um, a lot of information on him. I really like that part of the exhibit. It has a lot, it has a personal touch to it. It's not just strictly her career as a Supreme Court justice and all the different legal type things that she was involved in. I really like the book and the exhibit, Notorious RBG, because it does talk a lot about her personal life. And you really, when you read the book or go through the exhibit, you really get a sense of what she was like as a person and all the different people um, that shaped her and influenced her. And I like this quote um, from her husband. He talks about, if you, you know, you might remember that time when you were a teenager in your early 20s, and you're trying to figure out what you want to be when you grow up. And, um, you know, if you're like some people, maybe myself included, you're still not even sure what you want to be when you grow up. But he has this really nice quote, it says, talking about when they were trying to decide between the two of them what they were going to do when they grew up, he says, we actually sat down and by process of elimination came up with the law. So they were both going to go to law school. And they ended up going to Harvard Law School. But they had some problems at Harvard Law School because Ruth's um, husband, Marty, got cancer and he needed to go to New York to get treatment. And so they had to leave Harvard and go to Columbia. Now, there were some kind of problems with her. Um, she wanted, Ruth wanted to um, basically take classes at Columbia and transfer the credits back to Harvard. Um, and Harvard would not let her and it caused a little bit of a rift and et cetera, et cetera. But suffice to say, she, it's, it's kind of a, I'm oversimplifying that story um, in the essence of time, but um, suffice to say she started at Harvard, but then she transferred to Columbia with her husband, and that's where she ends up graduating from Columbia Law School, and here's some pictures of her, and just like she did at her undergraduate, she maintained a very strong relationship with Columbia for the rest of her life. This is interesting. This is a news article, and look at the headline. Law faculty selects first woman member. So Ruth Bader Ginsburg was the first woman tenured professor on the legal law school staff of Columbia University. So imagine that pioneer. I feel like a lot of things like this that she did, um, they're important for her life, but then also people may not be familiar with some of these aspects. I think some people might just be familiar with like, oh yeah, she was a Supreme Court justice and you know she did all this pop culture stuff, but she really had a fascinating life of all these things that she was um, involved with and did and achieved um, and participated in before she became a Supreme Court justice. So I really feel like that's a, an important part of the story. Here she is teaching. Now, if only they had YouTube back then, they could have um, recorded <laughs> some of these uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg law lectures and we could have watched them on TV and see what they were like, but I've not been able to come across any of those. If you ever find any of those sources, let me know. If you want to hear Ruth Bader Ginsburg's uh, thoughts on torts and criminal law and all that good stuff. Now, her husband plays a really, really important role in her life. And I liked this article. It was from Vogue. Uh, and it says, may every woman find her Marty Ginsburg. And they just had this really, really super strong relationship, which is really uh, refreshing because of all the kind of marital issues that are taking place out in the world. But Ruth Bader Ginsburg and her husband Marty had this really, by all accounts, really super strong uh, relationship. They just seemed like the perfect match for one another, um, a very loving couple. I saw an article, um, I think maybe it was a couple years ago, it was like secrets from um, long-term married couples, and she was in there as well, for both of them. This is a picture of them after they got married. And again, in the exhibit, they include a lot of the personal stuff. And I really like that a lot. I like the fact that it just wasn't strictly all about her career um, in the legal world. It did include stuff 
about her parents and her growing up and going to school and her husband and her kids and stuff like that. And I really like that aspect of it because if you go to a lot of museum exhibits that feature a person, it usually is focused on um, just kind of more of the uh, professional type stuff, so to speak. This is a famous picture of her and her husband and their daughter playing on the bed. And they talk in the exhibit about how uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, she did not like to cook and was not very good at cooking. But fortunately for her and their children, her husband really liked to cook. And by all accounts, he was a really good cook. And they talk a lot about the kind of non-traditional uh, marriage they had at the time. It may be more commonplace now, but back in the 1950s, you know, the man went off to work, the woman stayed home, did all the cooking and cleaning and that kind of stuff. And the woman to a certain degree subservient to her husband. And they had much more of a partnership, which was really unusual, particularly for that point in time. And that's why when you go back and look at this um, article, the, the reason why they type may every woman find her Marty Ginsburg, he was just extremely supportive of her career from day one and she benefits from that. And of course he benefits from it as well, but really um, different than like the 1950s. You might kind of, if you're familiar with the TV show, Leave it to Beaver, I mean, that's just kind of the way it was back then, but that's not the way the Ginsburg marriage was. And here's a quote that Ruth gave about her husband. She says, if you have a caring life partner, you help the other person when that person needs it. I had a life partner who thought my work was important as his. And I think that made all the difference for me. And again, that may just seem kind of matter of fact now, but you have to think about the time that they were married um, and the era that they were growing up in much different today. And even today, women still challenge um, with this uh, kind of pre- um, modern role that um, many women had still trying to break out of that grass ceiling type of situation. Now, um, Ruth, when she was married to Marty, he had cancer um, while he was in law school. And so she was kind of doing like um, triple duty. On the one hand, she had her own law studies that she had to do. Then she was helping him with his because he was also um, fighting the cancer. And then of course, she was also a wife and a mother. So she's doing these three roles simultaneously and by all accounts excelled at all three. And here's a nice picture of them a little bit later in life. So just a really amazing match between the two of them. Here's some pictures of Ruth as she's out of law school now and she's uh, progressing through the legal world, getting involved in different types of things, working on a lot of gender issues and civil rights and stuff like that. I believe this photo is from 1977. And again, they include a lot of this types of stuff in the exhibit. I like this quote, it says, I think that, actually, let me give him, there's a more of a close up picture. I think that men and women should, sorry, I think that men and women shoulder to shoulder will work together to make this a better world. Now, I don't want to get into a really long legal discussion um, how the court system works, but suffice to say, here's just like a really quick overview of how Ruth Bader Ginsburg partially ended up on the Supreme Court. It's a partial discussion. You could have a long talk just on this, but the Supreme Court in the United States is the highest court in the land. And there's kind of two paths that legal cases flow up to the Supreme Court over on the right. You can see there's state trial courts, immediate appellate courts, and state supreme courts. If you follow the news, um, these types of terms are always being used in different types of legal cases. And then on the other side, there's the U.S. District Court and the U.S. Court of Appeals. And so before Ruth Bader Ginsburg made it to the Supreme Court, she was appointed a judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals, which is one of the two feeder routes. The, you know, where does the Supreme Court get their cases from? Well, they usually get them from either the U.S. Court of Appeals or the state supreme court. And so she's appointed a judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals, which is the court right below the Supreme Court. And it was good training, experience, exposure, et cetera, et cetera, for her role later on the Supreme Court. And they have these um, court jurisdictions are broken up. So every part of the United States is broken up into one of these regions. And the court cases will go through and get heard in these different jurisdictions. And so that's what Ruth is doing. And so in 1980, President Jimmy Carter, he appointed her to be 
the appeals court judge for the DC region. And so this is a famous photo of her with President Carter in 1980. And so she hadn't been a judge um, in a role like this before. And so it was a really um, big appointment for her to receive this. And this is after Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away, the Carters released a nice statement about her passing. She said, uh, wrote, he said, Rosalind and I are saddened by the passing of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a powerful legal mind and staunch advocate for gender equality. She has been a beacon of justice during her long and remarkable career. I was proud to have appointed her to the US Court of Appeals in 1980. We joined countless Americans in mourning the loss of a truly great woman. We will keep her family in our thoughts and prayers during this difficult time. So Jimmy Carter plays a really important role in Ruth Bader Ginsburg make to the Supreme Court because as I'm showing in this other kind of visual image, you can see kind of the progression of how cases make their way through the legal system. And when he appoints her to this role, she's in the court that's right below the Supreme Court. So a pretty profile position, a very important position and gives her a lot of great experience and visibility and et cetera, et cetera. And they talk about that in the exhibit. I forgot to mention, so the exhibit, if you're seeing the words that are in um, kind of like handwriting, those are from Notorious B.I.G., the rapper. So it's really cool. They intertwine his words um, with the things about her. And so that's one of his quotes. Don't let them hold you down. Reach for the stars. Now, it's something that easily could have been said by Ruth Bader Ginsburg. In fact, maybe she did at some point in time. But if you see the text that's written kind of in handwriting in like the large letters, those are quotes from him. So they intertwine that. And this is a photo of her when she was in that role. Here's her in her office. Look at all those books. And this is pictures from the exhibit. So they have kind of a mock-up at her desk that you can sit at. You can make some phone calls. Um, Notice this desk is, <laughs> this is an older version of her desk. Notice there's no um, computer on it, but lots of books and papers and et cetera, et cetera. And the American flag, there's, it might be hard to see depending on the, um, how big your screen is, but there's to the left of the American flag, there's a picture of her and her husband and their two kids on a boat. I'll show you the picture of that a little bit later. And let's talk about the Supreme Court. So. Ruth Bader Ginsburg nominated to the Supreme Court by President Bill Clinton. And it's a really uh, important process. It's been in the news a lot um, the past many, many years. Whenever a Supreme Court justice uh, opening comes up, it's a big uh, topic of discussion in the United States and oftentimes a big debate and an important moment for a president in shaping their legacy. And they basically, it's like an interview process. The president's team uh, basically vets all the different Supreme Court candidates. They oftentimes have kind of a mental list of who's um, would be a good fit for these types of positions. They come to get vetted by the team. And then eventually, usually what happens is the person ends up meeting the president um, because the president's really making uh, an important decision. In fact, the pointing of Supreme Court justice Probably one of the most important things that a president can do and they want to make sure that they get it done correctly. Um, and so he meets Ruth Bader Ginsburg and then come to find out, okay, she's the person I'm going to go with. And then they have this big announcement um, ceremony. And so that's what's taking place here. It's Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Bill Clinton. They're walking out of the White House and they're on their way to the announcement ceremony, notice, notifying the press and the public that she is his nominee for the Supreme Court. And so this is a picture of her speaking. So these are pretty famous photos of her um, and Bill Clinton. If you've ever seen these before but didn't know the context, um, that's what's happening here is he's announcing her appointment as a nominee for the United States Supreme Court. And then they always have to give a speech. You can see her speech online. I didn't include um, any text or audio. It's, it's, a, it's a nice speech. Um, she talks about how thankful she is to Bill Clinton for giving him, her the opportunity and how she doesn't uh, want to disappoint him and stuff like that. But for the essence of time, I didn't include any of that. But if you want to pull it up on YouTube or get a transcript of it, it's widely available on the internet, kind of outlines what her kind of um, thought process will be moving forward as a Supreme Court judge. And then after the person gets uh, 
nominated, they have to go through the nomination process through the Senate. And so that's what's taking place here. That's um, This is a cute photo. That's her husband uh, reaching over to kind of uh, pat her on the shoulder and, you know, give her the kudos and the good luck and, you know, I love you and all that good stuff. So a nice touching photo of her. And the the hearing that she had, it was, it was as far as Supreme Court um, nominations go, it was pretty uneventful. There have been some of the more recent ones, um, and even some of the prior ones from many, many years ago have been kind of, um, uh, what would you say, a um, lot more theatrics involved. <laughs> Hers was pretty straightforward. Um, one of the things that was funny, though, was when she brought this book that one of her grandchildren, her grandson wrote, um, says, my grandma is very special. <laughs> and it's written by her grandson. So if you've ever seen this picture or wondered what she was doing, um, this is at her Supreme Court nomination hearing in front of the Senate. Um, she's showing that, hey, listen, though, a lot of people think I'm the right person. In fact, my grandson is really impressed with me as well. So nice touch on her to kind of personalize things. Um, this is a hard matrix to look at, but I just wanted to show you um, that this is the, all the Supreme Court nominees from the different presidents and how they fared. And it's um, the, the process is really fascinating because some of the Supreme Court nominees go through very easily. Some are challenged and don't actually make it. Um, some are challenged and they do make it. And so this matrix kind of shows you kind of the history of most of the recent uh, Supreme Court nominees dating back to President George H.W. Bush. Um, and you can see if you look at the blue box, it's kind of down to the right side, um, the Sup Senate vote for Ruth Bader Ginsburg's nomination was 96 in favor three not in favor and there was one person who did not vote because they were not available and she was nominated uh, or she was confirmed on August 3rd 1993 which amazing that it was that long ago some more information on the vote uh, these are all the different senators and how they voted and not everyone was in favor of Ruth Bader Ginsburg being uh, chosen to be on the Supreme Court. This is Senator Jesse Helms uh, from North Carolina. And he said famously, um, this lady who I have regarded as a pleasant intellectual liberal is in fact a woman whose beliefs are 180 degrees in opposition to some fundamental principles that are important, not only to me, but I believe to the majority of other Americans. So again, it's just, um, I, just I don't bring this up to, as a political discussion, it's more of that's interesting to go back and see um, how things change over time. And you know, what was the debate about her? He was um, not happy about her stance on abortion. And then he also, um, I think he used something about, she, she was um, something about um, a homosexual agenda or something like that in terms of like gay rights. So um, just kind of an interesting footnote there. Not, not everybody was in favor. I, I'm pointing this out. I'm showing you this information because now Ruth Bader Ginsburg is so widely popular amongst most circles. But I just want to kind of point this out that this was her confirmation process. And, you know, there's not a lot of Supreme Court justices that they don't get support from her, but it's not something that's very uh, uncommon to take place. And it wasn't, the, that was the case for her as well. But she does go through the nomination process, gets approved by the Senate, and this is her getting sworn in. So this is another famous photo of her. So if you've ever seen these pictures and weren't quite sure what the context was, this is being her sworn in as a Supreme Court justice. So that's the process. You get nominated, uh, then you go through the confirmation process, and then if all goes well, you're sworn in. These are just some other pictures of Ruth Bader Ginsburg involved in different things. This is a couple years later after um, she was moved to the Supreme Court. This is Bill Clinton. He was having a ceremony at the White House designating March as Women's History Month. And this is her uh, giving the oath of office to Vice President Al Gore in 1997. And when Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away, of course, Bill Clinton, who plays this really important role in her life and career by nominating her to the Supreme Court, um, he released a statement. Um, I'll let you read that if you want to. 
um, it's on the right. So again, the statement that he released after Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away. And again, the, you, I can't emphasize enough how important um, the, the Supreme Court selection process is for presidents. I mean, that's why no matter what president is, whether it's a Republican or a Democratic, it's this huge amount of debate and discussion because it is um, such an important part. And depending on the justice, it can really be an important part of the president's legacy. And so Ruth Bader Ginsburg will always be strongly connected to Bill Clinton. So a picture of her later in life. Here's some more photos for you. So again, many of these, not all of them, but many of them are in the notorious RBG exhibit. Now at Ruth Bader Ginsburg, one of the things that she's known for is what's called her dissents. And what a dissent is, is when the Supreme Court makes a decision, a case will come before the Supreme Court and the judges, the nine judges have to decide what they're gonna do. Um, and sometimes the decisions are unanimous and, or anonymous and, or unanimous, sorry. Uh, and sometimes they're not. And there was a series of five cases that came up mostly in regards to civil rights type issues. Um, some of them relating to gender and voting and stuff like that, where Ruth Bader Ginsburg had a different opinion than the majority of her Supreme Court colleagues. And so she's issuing what's called a dissent. It's basically her um, argument of why she believes the court decision was incorrect. And so this is kind of what she becomes um, known for. So if you see uh, the, a word that's associated with Ruth Bader Ginsburg frequently is dissent or the, or the term I dissent. Um, and it comes from this, it comes from this 2013 series of these cases. And, you know, if this was more of a, a, a longer presentation or if it had more of a, a legal focus, we could get in all the nuts and bolts of the cases. But suffice to say, um, if you probably one of the words most closely associated with Ruth Bader Ginsburg is the word dissent. And it comes from her opposition to her colleagues on several of these cases. Now they don't have cameras in the Supreme Court, but they have court artists. So that's what these images are from. And these are on display at the notorious RBG exhibit. Um, and I like this quote from her a lot. It says the decision, this is kind of an example, sorry, let me back up. This is an example of kind of her thought process. The decision whether or not to bear a child is central to a woman's life, to her well-being and dignity. It is a decision she must make herself. When government controls that decision for her, she is being treated as less than a fully adult human responsible for her own choices. So I'm not saying that this is a pro-life or pro-choice discussion, just strictly giving you the context of what Ruth Bader Ginsburg opinion was on this matter. Uh, here's one of the last photos of the Supreme Court justices that were in place when Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away. And if you get a chance, if you ever go to Washington, D.C., you should go visit the Supreme Court. You can actually hear the arguments. Now, you can't do it now, of course, because of COVID. But what the process is, I've done it myself. In, in normal times, what you do is you just show up outside the Supreme Court. You get there as early as you can. They have a ton of information on their website on uh, what the process is like. But basically what happens is during normal times when we're not dealing with COVID, you just show up early in the morning. There's like a a uh, queue that starts up. Uh, and then once they open the doors, they let you know, X number of people come in at a time. The queue or the line that you wait in uh, really varies a lot. If you go in the summer, uh, like in the middle of tourist season, expect the line to be really, really long. Um, if you go in the winter, like I did last time, I think the last time I went was in um, like uh, early December. The line wasn't really that long at all, but we got there, my friend and I about maybe, I don't know, I think like 45 minutes before they were going to open the doors <laughs> and it was really cold and windy. So it was kind of challenging to um, sit out or stand outside and wait for the doors to open. But once they did, then you go inside and there's a museum all about the Supreme Court. That's really fascinating. Um, you can check that out and then you can actually go inside the kind of uh, shepherd you in, you sit out in the back and you just listen to the arguments and it's um, really interesting. Just it's kind of sort of what you'd expect, but it's also a little bit different. Um, it's yeah, everyone's very quiet except for the person who's speaking in front of the justices. Um, they're sitting there listening and taking notes and whatnot. But it's a, it's a really interesting process. And I really did like the exhibits that they have. So that's not kind of related to the notorious RBG um, exhibit, so to speak. And of course, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is not on the Supreme Court anymore. I'm just saying as an American, if you get a chance, um, you really should go check out the Supreme Court if you have an opportunity to do so. Really interesting process. 
Um, what was Ruth Bader Ginsburg's office like at the Supreme Court? Well, here's some pictures of that. This is an older picture. And a more recent one. Look at all the books and pictures and stuff. So it's an interesting kind of combination of you have a lot of books, you have a lot of awards that she receives throughout her career. Um, there's a lot of artwork and pictures. So it's interesting just to kind of see, um, you know, you learn a lot about a person by looking at their office and seeing what's it's, it's hard to tell, um, but there's a sculpture that's on the left side of her desk, like our left side of her desk. And it's hard to see, but it's a cute sculpture. I wish I could have a zoom, uh, more close up picture of it, but I can't. It's basically, it's Ruth Bader Ginsburg in her Supreme Court robe. And then her husband, he's dressed up as a chef. Um, so that's kind of a cute, we we're talking about the cooking duties a little bit earlier. And Ruth Bader Ginsburg is known for these lace collars. Um, and so that was one of the things that they talked about in that book discussion should, if you're discussing important women, should you discuss things like fashion? So I thought, well, um, it's kind of what she's known for. So let's do a little bit of a discussion about that. So this is one that's actually at the museum exhibit. But there's a number of different ones um, that she ends up wearing. And, and this is kind of one of the components of the exhibit, kind of talking about this, kind of how she's um, um, is a unique representation of the, the normal legal attire. And then here's her quote on the matter. She says, the standard robe, meaning the robe that the Supreme Court justices wear. The standard robe is made for a man because it has a place for the shirt to show and the tie. So Sandra Day, O'Connor and I thought it would be appropriate if we include as part of our robe something typical of a woman. So I have many, many collars. And so it's kind of one of her signature fashion items, which is unique because you don't normally consider uh, Supreme Court justices to be kind of um, fashion trendsetters or trailblazers, so to speak, but Ruth Bader Ginsburg was. And the collars are all kind of similar, but they're all a little bit different as well. Here are some examples. Just to give you a sense of what that looks like. And they're not all necessarily white. Some of them have colors. Now, traditionally, if you go back and look at photos of her um, earlier in her Supreme Court career, they were always white. But then as time went by, she started including kind of some of these more intricate designs and patterns. And some of them oftentimes have colors in them. And hey, what does Ruth Bader Ginsburg's closet look like? Well, <laughs> these are pictures of them. So it's kind of funny. I mean, if you had to do like a research project and find pictures of any other Supreme Court justice's closet, you'd probably really be challenged to do so. But Ruth Bader Ginsburg, oh yeah, yeah, sure. There's lots of pictures floating around the internet of what her closet looks like. And of course you can see she's got all the collars on display and you can pick out which one she's gonna wear. And then she's demonstrating, uh, you know, the different items. And, you know, a lot of these had meaning if she was, she, the, she didn't just randomly pick the, the collars frequently. Sometimes if there was an important case that she was going to be discussing or delivering a dissent on or going to a particular event, um, the collar would be, have some kind of meaning attached to it. It wasn't just kind of a haphazard, just reach in and grab one and put it on. But again, an interesting aspect that she's taking along with Sandra Day O'Connor, the kind of traditional Supreme Court robe, which is very, um, um, I don't know, it's not very personalized and personalizing with these collars. She got a kick out of this particular one. And the only reason why this is important um, is just because it's part of her image and her um, kind of what she's known for. I thought this was interesting magazine article from the New Yorker and they use the collar on her cover um, to identify as her. So it doesn't even include an image of her, just strictly the collar. Um, and so that kind of shows you the power that the image or that aspect of her personality had as far as her um, notoriety, so to speak, within the public. They could just put this image of a collar and people would know who it was they were talking about. So pretty cool in that regard. Now, what did Ruth Bader Ginsburg do for fun? Like when, when she wasn't doing all this legal stuff, um, what did she do for fun? So she liked to travel. And so this was a picture that was on her desk that I was talking about earlier. This is her, her husband and their two kids. They're on a boat in the Virgin Islands. This is a trip to Egypt. 
This is a, taking the train across France to Paris. That's her and her husband. It was nice because they had a lot of similar interests and their personalities um, uh, were a good match for one another. Now this is her and her fellow Supreme Court justice on top of an elephant. So this is also kind of a famous picture of her because it's kind of so quirky. But again, she liked to travel. Um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, of course, was Jewish and faith and religion uh, play a very important part of her life. She talks frequently about the fact that the challenges that she faced as a woman, as a Jew, and as a mother. In fact, when she graduated from law school, she was not able to find a regular um, job, a regular type of legal job that the male law school graduates were able to obtain. She interviews with all these different law firms in New York City, um, and primarily because she's a woman, but also to potentially religion, and then the fact that she was a mother proved to be detrimental for her. So she, one big, um, it was to me as a man, I, when I was reading about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, I expected to hear stories of uh, sexism that was um, a part of her life. What I was surprised by is how prevalent it was and how um, damaging it was. And again, I'm saying that as a man, I expected to see uh, in you reading the notorious RBG and studying her life, I expected to see sexism because I knew that's been going on for a long time. It's still going today. But as a man, I was surprised how prevalent it was. I mean, it was like, kind of like a reoccurring theme throughout her whole entire life of just having to deal with all this extra uh, drama and that she does over and end up overcoming all of that. So very inspiring um, to be able to read her story and her accomplishments. Now, if you are familiar with Washington, D.C., where did Ruth Bader Ginsburg live? She lived at the Watergate complex, which is made famous for the Watergate break-in. Um, that wasn't in the part of the complex that Ruth Bader Ginsburg was living in, but if you're familiar with the Washington DC area, Ruth Bader Ginsburg lived in the Watergate complex, which is a good place for her to be because um, if you've been to the Watergate before, even though it's a pretty big building, it's not a place that like tourists go to very often unless they're um, going for a particular reason. So if she was like living in Georgetown or something like that, there'd probably always be uh, people out in front of her front door and stuff like that. But in Georgetown, it's more of a secluded place. It's kind of a, out of the touristy areas. And so you don't really get as many people going through there, but just FYI on that. And another thing that Ruth Bader Ginsburg was really active in was exercising. That was one reason why she lived so long. She took good care of herself. And so a uh, really important part of her life. She frequently wore these um, sweaters and shirts while she was working out. Super diva, which was really cool. And here she is giving her go on her exercise. So, hey, if, you, if, if you're like me and you're thinking, gee, I just don't exercise as much as I should. And maybe your New Year's resolution is going to be, you're going to exercise more. Well, hold on to this picture. Um, and maybe Ruth Bader Ginsburg can inspire you because she was very devout at taking good care of herself. And all of us should try and do the same. Um, here was a little quote from her um, talking about the different types of exercises she did. She had a trainer. She spent a lot of time, there's a gym at the Watergate complex and she had a trainer that she would work with and then she would also do things at home. But again, if you know Ruth Bader Ginsburg, really active life, super busy, uh, being a justice in the Supreme Court and then all the different things that she was involved in outside of that role, uh, she was able to find time to exercise. We got to try and find time ourselves. And then this is a page from the notorious RBG book. Remember the book that I was discussing earlier that um, preceded the exhibit? They actually even have a section talking about what her workout is like. And so um, you can toss the ball and you know do all this other kind of stuff that she was involved in. So you can, you can actually follow the notorious RBG workout if you so choose to. So FYI on that. Again, this one thing is just fascinating about her as a person. Just, yeah, the legal stuff is really impactful on society and that plays a huge role in our history and development of the country, but just a fascinating, interesting person just involved in all these uh, different unusual things. And if you're not too familiar with Ruth Bader Ginsburg, you wouldn't think that she would be a source of inspiration for exercising, but hey, why not? We need all the inspiration we can get. Uh, and look at this photo and see if you recognize Ruth Bader Ginsburg in this photo. Where is she? Hey, she's front and center. <laughs> and so um, her favorite pastime was the opera. She loved the opera. She had been exposed to it as a young girl. She just thought the music was beautiful. And one of her favorite pastimes 
was either listening to opera music or going to the opera herself. And so this was the Washington DC opera um, and her and Judge Scalia, her counterpart on the Supreme Court, that's him on the right. He also liked to travel uh, and also loved the opera. Um, and so frequently they would do these things together. And so this is them um, in <laughs> kind of guest starring roles in this particular opera. So that's Judge Scalia on the middle right, and that's Ruth Bader Ginsburg on the middle left. So if you've ever seen this picture, um, I see this circulated quite a bit like on websites and magazines and stuff. If you ever see this picture, it's um, no, that's not her dressed up for Halloween. And that's not her husband that's standing uh, to her left, to our right. That's Judge Scalia, who was her counterpart in Supreme Court, but they had these guest roles in the opera in Washington, D.C. many, many years ago. And then here is a more recent one. Uh, this was the headline. Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's make politically pointed operatic debut. So in this role, she actually had a speaking part, <laughs> which was really cool. And it got a lot of fanfare, uh, both in D.C. and then throughout the kind of opera world that Ruth Bader Ginsburg showed up and had this small speaking role. Um, so that would have been a really cool thing to see. I didn't see that myself in person, but looked pretty awesome. But again, it's just kind of a unique touch that she has as far as a pop culture icon. And the gown that she wore during the opera is on display at the Notorious RBG exhibit. So yet one more reason um, to go check it out. And then again, depending on the resolution on your screen, you can see over to the right of the gown, the pictures that I was showing you earlier. So again, a lot of these images are from the exhibit. Some of them are not. I'm kind of adding some supplemental stuff, but give you a sense for that. This is her at the Kennedy Center. And this is another picture at the Kennedy Center. Looks like she's got a glass of champagne in her hand. But I think it's um, non-alcoholic champagne because Ruth Bader Ginsburg did not drink alcohol, nor did her husband. They didn't even serve it in their house. Um, and then in addition to being her legal duties of the Supreme Court, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg really out in the public a lot, uh, giving interviews and doing talks and lectures and things like that. And so it's frequently um, not uncommon to see her out and about. This is just actually a few months before she passed away at Georgetown University. And this is the film that came out on the basis of sex. So this was the Ruth Bader Ginsburg film. All of these kind of, uh, a lot of these things that are related to her that we're talking about kind of came out around the same time. The Notorious RBG book came out in 2015, but the exhibit debuted in 2018. This film uh, debuted in 2018. And then there was also a documentary called RBG that came out in the same year. And so I'm not going to spend a ton of time on the film, just kind of want to give you a heads up that, hey, this is out there. Um, if you've actually seen it before, uh, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, FYI, just kind of some interesting aspects of the film, though. It was actually written by Ruth Bader Ginsburg's nephew. That's kind of a cartoon picture of the two of them. So yes, this film, the screenplay, was actually written by Ruth Bader Ginsburg's nephew. He had the idea. He went. He said he went to a family function, um, and he he didn't have a super close relationship with her initially. I mean, she was just kind of a distant aunt, and you know, she's living in Washington D.C. and he's in New York a lot of the time and stuff. Um, so they didn't have a super close relationship, but over time they did get closer and closer. And then um, when he heard her speaking and was she was kind of telling some stories that wow she I should we should do like a movie or something about her and so she he pitched the idea of a screenplay to her and she was kind of lukewarm about it she said well if that's what you want to spend your your time on um go ahead and he starts interviewing her and they got really really close during the production or during the, the process of actually writing this screenplay um eventually he had some I got married and hey, how cool would it be to have Ruth Bader Ginsburg officiating over your wedding? And so that's her nephew on the right and that's his wife on the left. So that was pretty neat. So again, he was the one that had the idea of the film and he was the one who wrote the screenplay. And then he said, as he spent time with her on it, um, they just felt just a much stronger relationship for her. And he just, he talks about how moved he was by her, just being in her presence and learning about her. Um, it just became more and more kind of a passion project for him. Uh, the movie comes out and Ruth Bader Ginsburg actually um, was told who was going to play the, 
part of herself and her husband. Um, I don't, th I don't think she um, had like veto power on the, the role, so to speak, but she was in favor of the two um, main cast members. She actually met them uh, during uh, or before and during the production process. She actually kind of um, gave them some pointers to think about, <laughs> which is interesting. And again, one of the kind of themes of the film is just Ruth Bader Ginsburg just having to overcome all these gender related issues. Again, you would expect to see that knowing that it's a film about her, but just it was a dominant part of the story, just all the extra drama she had to deal with just from strictly being a woman. And of course, at the same time, she's also a wife and raising two children. Now, I'm curious if any, how many of you have seen this movie and what or not what you thought about it. So actually, let me do this. Let me queue up another one of these poll questions. So, oops, hold on. Oops, move it back. So I'm curious to know if you've seen this movie and whether or not you liked it. I, if you read reviews on it, um, as far as the crit movie critics go, it was, I'd say, kind of mildly favorable. Um, they basically, the critical response was that um, you know, it was a good movie. It kind of checked off a lot of the boxes. There was a couple minor like um, historical things that they didn't get correct, but the, the kind of the consensus was, you know, the movie was fine. It, you know, it talked about her life, but it wasn't as like amazing and as she was. <laughs> the, the movie didn't quite live up to the how awesome Ruth Bader Ginsburg herself was. So I'm curious to know um, what you guys thought. Let me actually end the polling and I'll share the results. So it looks like about half the audience today has seen the movie and those that did liked it. I think I'm just guessing, but in my opinion, if you watch this movie and you don't know anything about Ruth Bader Ginsburg or not really interested in the types of issues that she was involved in, um, you know, you may or may not like it. If you do like her and want to learn more about it, I do feel like the film does kind of capture the essence of her life. And so if you are looking for an opportunity to learn more about her, you can go check that out and you can find it on all the different internet sites. Okay, let's continue on. Thanks for your participation in that. That was pretty cool. Okay, we're getting into the home stretch of our presentation today. The stars of the film and Ruth Bader Ginsburg's nephew, the guy who wrote the screenplay, actually visited the exhibit when it opened in Los Angeles. That's the pictures of them there. And it was released in 2018. Um, Felicity Jones is known as being uh, one of the members of Star Trek um, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, funnily, when they told her um, who was gonna be playing her in the movie, she said, oh great, can she sign my Star Wars poster? So I'm assuming at some point in time she did, but yeah, Felicity Jones and Army Hammer both actually met Ruth Bader Ginsburg um, and kind of got the chance to talk to her and you know, kind of learn more about her and whatnot like that. So it's kind of a funny, um, but it pretty it was a pretty successful commercial uh, feature as well. I mean, it wasn't a blockbuster, but um, it was profitable in that regard. But again, a pretty good movie. I wouldn't rank it on my all time list of favorites. But if you want to know more about Ruth Bader Ginsburg and kind of want to get the essence of what uh, part of her life was about to give you a sense for that. The film that I like better, though, is a documentary. It's called RBG, um, and it came out the same year. It also came out in 2018. So um, if you have a time to see both of these films, uh, feel free to do so. If you only had time to see one, or if you're more of like a documentary type person, um, I would recommend this one. Now, what I'll do is when I'm done talking, I actually have a short clip of the film that we trailer um, for both the feature film and the documentary, and then the short clip about the movie or the um, museum exhibit, but I'll show those at the very end. And again, the film is called RBG. It was a documentary. Um, and here's just some information on it. So again, if you're looking for kind of something more um, less Hollywood-esque um, and you want to learn about Ruth Bader Ginsburg or you know someone that does, you might prefer the documentary format instead. And there's a book that also came out called My Own Words, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. This is more if you're looking for something kind of meaty and substantive. The, the Notorious RBG book, um, it has more of like a pop culture type feel to it. This one has more of like an autobiographical and kind of a um, kind of more of the legal context of her career. So if you're kind of looking for something more uh, substantial to learn more about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, you can get this book called My Own Words. And what do other people think of this book? Well, on Amazon, 
Uh, it has over 4,000 ratings and look, it has five stars. So that's pretty impressive uh, review from people. And again, the, the, that's an amazing is a book review because a lot of the people that complain about books when they write the reviews, they're not actually even reviewing the book itself. <laughs> they're reviewing like the, the company they bought it from or the delivery process or whatever. So oftentimes books um, are are better than the reviews just because of the oftentimes the the delivery mechanism is what's getting reviewed in the Amazon reviews. But this one does have five stars, pretty impressive. Here's the back covers of it. It has two different back covers depending on if you get the hard cover or the paperback. And of course, Saturday Night Live. So again, there's just all these kind of pop culture things that Ruth Bader Ginsburg has been a part of um, from her time in the Supreme Court forward. It really kind of helps uh, increase her stature, so to speak, in at least in terms of like publicity, which you have to feel is positive because if people, when people knew who she was, it kind of gives her more of a platform to basically express her ideas and talk about change that she would like to see. So Kate McKinnon, very talented. Um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg actually commented a few times, like people would ask her like, what did you think of um, you being portrayed on Saturday Night Live? And she kind of played it off and she, she, Ruth Bader Ginsburg never seemed like a very pretentious person. And so she seemed actually okay with the critique of that. Um, now here are the four women Supreme Court justices in a photo. And the reason why I'm showing you them is, again, they frequently out in events. This is the museum in Washington, D.C. This is one of my favorite places to go visit. Unfortunately, it closed about a year ago, but this was a panel discussion that they had a while back. And I wanted to include this. This is not at the Notorious RBG exhibit, but I wanted to include it because we're a Washington, D.C. based organization. And this is one of the most famous and popular paintings that, that's the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery. Um, so this is a painting called The Four Justices by Nelson Shanks. I want to include it not because um, it's not part of the notorious RBG exhibit. I want to include it though because we're a Washington DC based organization and this is one of the most famous well known uh, popular paintings at the Smithsonian. Um, I say that because you can tell just because uh, the number of people that are always standing in front of it taking selfies. So this is a picture I took myself last, um, let's see, September. I visited the museum just really, really briefly. And I'm not exaggerating, the museum wasn't even really crowded on this day. I went uh, very early when they opened on a weekday. I think it was a Thursday, there wasn't any people. But even then, I still had to wait like quite a few minutes to take this picture because there was like a steady stream of people always standing in front of this picture. And I was like, will you people get the heck out of the way so I can take my picture? Um, but you always see people taking pictures of this or selfies or whatever. And so I wanted to include it in our presentation in case you've ever seen this before and wondered where it was at. Or if you are in Washington, DC, um, you can go take a look at it. So again, it's at the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery in Washington, DC. The artist's name is Nelson Shanks. He unfortunately passed away five years ago. It was called The Four Justice. Now the painter, or the artist, he tells a funny story about how it was a real challenge for him to do this work because he actually did this painting from life and he had the four justices show up one day and pose for him all at the same time. And he talked about how he had to keep telling them to behave themselves because they were laughing and joking, carrying on and all this stuff. And if you're doing a portrait of somebody, you need them to sit still. Um, they can't be moving around and waving their hands and laughing. And so you have to sit still and, and keep kind of a serious pose. And so it was funny, the artist Nelson Shanks, he talked about how challenging it was making this portrait of the four justices because they were carrying on and having a good old time while they were supposedly supposed to be posing for him. And there's the portrait again, and there's a close up. So, again, this is a really well known portrait of uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and her female counterparts. So, I just want to include it in the discussion just so if you've seen this before, um, you know where it's at. It's in Washington, D.C., or you just kind of knew some of the context of it. Um, how about this? This is a famous quote from Ruth Bader Ginsburg People ask me sometimes, when will there be enough women on the court? And my answer is, when there are nine. Now, it's not included in this caption but there's a extended part of this quote where you know she talks about how you know that might kind of shock people like well gee that's kind of profound when you say that there should be nine women on the court and i'm paraphrasing but she basically says well you know 
there were nine men on the court for the longest time, and most people didn't have issue with that. So FYI there, but that's one of the more well-known quotes from Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And again, she's a pop culture icon. Um, this was a sign in Washington, D.C. when she was having some health challenges. Hang in there, Ruth. She was a cancer survivor before she ended up succumbing to cancer. Uh, but eventually, Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away last September. I really like political cartoons, and so I thought I would wrap things up with these are some of the more noteworthy political cartoons that came out um, in honor of Ruth Bader Ginsburg when she passed away. Old justices never die were just sent to a higher court. Uh, this, one, this one is um, kind of making light of the fact that when uh, a judge enters a courtroom, the ballasts all rise. And then carry on. I, I like this message. It's, you know, Ruth's left us, but we as individuals can still carry on with her work. It's like her, her cause didn't end with her. It's up to us to kind of continue on those things that she believed in. There's a touching one, I'm making light of Michelangelo. And I like, this one was my favorite one. Thank you, Justice Ginsburg. Okay, so that's the official end of our program. I thought what I would do is Again, I talked about this was kind of a history of Ruth Bader Ginsburg in the context of the notorious RBG book and museum exhibit. We talked about the On the Basis of Sex film, the RBG documentary, and then the My Own Words, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Let me do this. I've been recording this, so let me stop that.